Welcome to the Supply Chain Pioneers Podcast, where we highlight industry leaders on the forefront of innovation and technology in planning, procurement, and logistics. Hosted by your supply chain pro to know, Ulf Venn. Welcome to a new Supply Chain Pioneers episode. And this one is a first for me personally, because I've never met my guest before this podcast. And Sechkin Ötzkul was great. He comes from a university background and he talks a lot about his research and how students are interacting with supply chain management, how they get there and why they stay. For me, it was a completely new field and probably for you as well. And that's why it's so extremely interesting. And I hope you enjoy the show and now have fun. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Supply Chain Pioneers. Today, I'm with Sechkin Ötzkul, and he is from another side of supply chain management, which is the university side. And he will talk about how he works with students and his research. And I'm very curious about his story and his journey. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. As always, we start with a short introduction. If you want to maybe introduce yourself and talk about the touch points you had with supply chain management and how you came to be a researcher and teacher on supply chain management. Sure, thank you so much. So my name is uh, Sech Kinoskul. I'm an assistant professor at the uh, MUMA College of Business at the University of South Florida. Uh, I'm also the director of our USF Supply Chain Innovation Lab at the Monica Wooden Center for Supply Chain Management and Sustainability, also at uh, the USF MUMA College of Business, uh, which is uh, located in Tampa, Florida, uh, in the United States of America. A little bit of my background, I have uh, three engineering degrees, including my PhD, uh, looking at mainly freight optimization. That's really my, my, my background comes. I look at freight movements, freight optimization, different freight facility location optimization. What are some really good places that uh, that uh, companies would like to, to get located with their facilities? From there, I got involved really in a lot of economic impact studies of uh, of freight flows, freight fluidity, and location analysis, and how that really impacts the the supply chain management and also the health of our supply chains. That's really how I landslided into the supply chain realm with an engineering background. I do have a a marketing uh, master's that actually specializes in supply chain management as well. That was uh, the cherry on top of the cake, if you will. And I'm uh, I'm really glad that I actually uh, got that uh, to to really get more into supply chain management and how really it it impacts our uh, our current world. Coming from a logistics background, then my my follow-up question would be, when you were when you were looking in university, okay, what is it I'm going to do with my life? How did you get in touch with the logistics world? Logistics, uh, as far as the, the freight movements are concerned, we were always involved at the university level. We were always involved with different logistics companies. So mm-hmm. we have advisory boards and we have uh, partners uh, that, that are basically private companies that are in logistics. So we always had uh, uh, our hand on the pulse, if you will, as far as logistics is concerned. And that's how we were able to pull all that knowledge in uh, to the university environment as well. And that's also basically when you were a student yourself, you you got in touch through these outside firms uh, when it comes to logistics. So when I was a student, my advisor had a lot of uh, uh, colleagues, a lot of uh, folks that he knew in these logistics companies. And we would basically get some data from them and then analyze that data. And as he was basically getting this data, he would copy me on the emails. And that's how I really developed some of my personal contacts as well. When in your life did you think this is my occupation? This is my passion. This is logistics and supply chain management is what I want to do, teach and instill knowledge to others and also research on. Really, as I was graduating uh, and I've been working on this topic for about a couple of years towards my PhD dissertation, and as I'm looking for different uh, faculty positions, uh, and you know, which happened to be at the University of South Florida, I really liked what I was doing towards my dissertation. Mm-hmm. I knew that uh, this is something that I'm passionate about, that I would like to do. I would like to to teach it to some other students as well so that we can get more workforce development, if you will, into our field. But really, towards the end of my PhD studies, I knew that this is really what I would like to do. And I know some folks, as they are getting to the towards the end of their uh, PhD studies, they realize, maybe this is not what I want to do, but I'm going to graduate, 
and then I'm going to branch out from there. But thankfully, it was not the case for me. I knew as I'm getting close to graduation, what I'm working on is really where my passion lies. Let's talk first a little bit about the, the research angle that you follow. What does your day in research look like? How do you structure your day as a researcher when it comes to logistics? As I wake up, right, um, we like we all do, I'm getting my morning joe, my morning cup of coffee, and uh, I am either on my, uh, on my uh, cell phone or smartphone reading some news. I'm really scrolling uh, mainly for uh, supply chain related news. What happened or what could impact supply chains? Just to give an example, uh, you know, as we are all aware right now, there are some horrible wildfires in Maui, Hawaii right now. So, so that those type of news as folks are reading and saying, oh my God, this is horrible. I am saying the same thing, but I'm also thinking, how is this going to impact my supply chains, right? So that's how I start my day. Uh, most of my day is refereeing uh, and also reading uh, research articles from different journals, from top leading supply chain management journals. Uh, I do a lot of academic research, so I need to keep up to date with the literature. Uh, I'm also, of course, working on my own research, uh, basically looking at data analytics. Uh, we're working on modeling supply chains. So that takes a, quite a bit of my time during the day uh, as we are working on these modeling efforts. Uh, looking at different data analytics methods. Uh, I'm also meeting with my graduate students, advising them on the current research that they are working on, mm -hmm. um, just trying to find the angle, which direction that we would like to take. And uh, and then, of course, I'm teaching my classes uh, that I'm teaching because that's another passion of mine is student success. Uh, students uh, will not be successful if we are not doing a good job teaching the classes that they are taking from us as faculty members. So I'm teaching uh, supply chain analytics uh, for the undergraduate level. And for the graduate level, I'm teaching Lean Six Sigma methods. So, mm -hmm. uh, so those are the two classes that I'm teaching this semester. So, so that also takes, of course, uh, quite a bit of my time uh, as much as my, my teaching uh, uh, responsibilities are involved. Uh, so this is pretty much a good idea of how my day goes, day in and day out. We, of course, have administrative meetings uh, just like every other business. So that also takes uh, some of my time uh, through a day. Uh, but uh, but really, uh, my passion uh, lies with uh, with teaching and research, uh, of course, as a professor at the university. A lot of things you mentioned were really focused around the university and other researchers. How do you stay up to date when it comes to things that are happening on ground, things that are developing sure. in the operations that spring up all of a sudden? How do you stay up to date on, on things like AI, but also on the latest development on um, data maturity within supply chain operations? I have uh, leadership positions in different uh, national and international level committees. So, so those committees really discuss what is really happening uh, uh, on the ground, if you will, to your question in the actual field not at a uh, university environment, if you will. Mm -hmm. So so that is uh, one great way of uh, always uh, having an ear on what is really happening and what are some of the current issues that needs addressing. Uh, another uh, great way that I'm keeping up to date is uh, through professional organizations, professional memberships, such as the, the Council for Supply Chain Management Professionals, CSCMP. Mm -hmm. uh, I do go to their uh, annual and also uh, summer meetings. I'm involved with the, the European chapter as well. We were recently uh, at the European meeting in Barcelona, Spain over the summer. Uh, and uh, the, the annual meeting for CSCMP is going to be in Orlando in October around the corner here as well. So, so through attending these meetings, you're able to, to talk with the industry and be able to actually discuss what is hot, what is the current problems that they are facing and think about solutions, how as academics, we can actually help advance the field, uh, seeing those current problems that's being observed by the companies. That's a perfect segue for one of my questions, actually. Sure. So looking at looking at the research you have made and your exchanges with operations, can you point to a research where you already were able to make an impact in, a, in an operational environment? I'm directing the USF Supply Chain Innovation Lab. And at mm -hmm. the lab, uh, what our motto is, we are a resource to the, the state of Florida, to the United States of America, to the world, and mm -hmm. also to companies. So uh, a private company that I'm not going to be able to, to name, but it's a Fortune 500 company, has uh, come to us about a year and a half ago 
and said, hey, you know, we really would like to implement end-to-end -end supply chain visibility. So basically this di digitization of supply chains, right? How do we see all the way to our suppliers inventory? How do they see our demand, current demand? How do my customers seize my capacity? Uh, what I'm working on right now, right? How busy are my lines? And how do I see, therefore, my clients' demand so that I can actually plan for all these, right? So that's the end-to-end the -end supply chain visibility. So we worked on a, an implementation roadmap for this Fortune 500 company where we basically looked at how can we uh, have strategic partnerships between the suppliers and the, the customers and this company that we're talking about so that they can actually combine their uh, operational entities using a software tool such as SAP and uh, and be able to have visibility throughout. Again, this cannot be done, in my opinion, with everyone and anyone. It's going to be through strategic partnerships because these are very sensitive data. But we were able to develop a roadmap for them to implement uh, this end-to-end -end supply chain visibility. So most of the projects we work at the lab, and the, the USF Supply Chain Innovation Lab, are really practical type of projects so that they can have immediate implications and uh, that can be implemented directly in the field itself. Follow-up question on that, because a lot of these providing a roadmap, right, eventually mm -hmm. comes down to, to changing the status quo. How do you, when you, when you build these roadmaps and you provide suggestions to these mm -hmm. companies, how do you make sure that they are able to challenge what they do right now and really implement the roadmap? later so one of the key is the the upper or the sea level the the leadership really needs to buy into that right so once uh once we are at the table talking with uh, with the higher ups we are basically uh, trying to get all of their buy-in before we even embark on the project itself because without their support it's going to be very difficult to implement a certain roadmap so so that is really key at the very basics and then we Throughout the project, we communicate at least with someone in the C-suite, like the chief supply chain management officer, so that we can uh, we can carry them along with us throughout the project, letting them know what is happening. If we can really have their full buy-in, they can carry the rest of the C-suite with them, is our belief, uh, in, in the buy-in process. Once the, the, the top management buys in, they can empower the, the middle management and also the, the on the floor to be able to implement this roadmap. That's how we approach this uh, as we are going on these projects. Top-down approach. Absolutely. So my last question on your, your research and your uh, the things you do together with operations would be, what is one of the research topics you're currently working on that you are extremely excited about? Well, that's fantastic. So I have an, uh, an uh, engineering background. I said the, op the operations, uh, operations research, the optimization background. We are currently experiencing some, uh, some issues with truck staging areas. And, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you hear about truck parking a lot and truck parking is an issue, right? Jason's law and all that. Uh, we knew that uh, uh, we need more truck parking. Then where do we really need them, right? The optimized locations because we can't pop truck parking everywhere. Is it going to be public? Is it going to be private? Is it going to be a little bit of a combination of both? I think we've been scratching truck parking a lot, but now there's this new phenomenon of truck staging, which is when you are a truck driver, you're making the basic deliveries and you're doing pickups, you're going to arrive a little early, right? And sometimes a little early becomes a lot early, right? You're there for two hours early, three hours early. And the entity that you are picking up from or delivering to, they are not ready to receive you as a as a truck to, to, to load or unload. So what do you do? You just find a location to park for a couple of hours so that you can actually eventually reroute yourself to do that delivery or to do that pickup. But where you normally locate yourself along the two hours, what we observe from the truck GPS data uh, is unfortunately illegal parking most of the time on the sides of the roadways, which is a big safety hazard. So, so what we are looking right now is what are some of the observed locations of big clusters of this unauthorized truck parking for a couple of hours between two to four hours, which we call truck staging. And can we look at some optimized locations of developing smaller facilities, not a full blown truck parking facility, but smaller facilities to be able to alleviate some of this illegal truck parking that we're seeing due to that truck staging issue. 
So we're basically looking at uh, big data. We're looking at uh, at uh, truck GPS data and where we're observing some issues. And then we are using ArcGIS to be able to to optimize or find some optimized locations, some parcels that uh, that the Florida Department of Transportation eventually can uh, can analyze and uh, and determine as truck staging areas that they can develop. So that's a that's a cool project that I'm currently working on. I'm excited about it. It's a little bit of a niche area. Truck staging is not what everyone is looking right now, and I think it's a big issue uh, that we need to solve. So essentially, it impacts right the community, absolutely, and, and then also the truck driver itself. I mean, uh, himself or herself. He That's right. probably they don't want to park illegally as well, right? They absolutely. just don't have another option. So absolutely, and again, you know, they are in the truck, so they are parked there. They're in the truck. They are attentive. But they don't have many options, just like you said. I mean, let's be realistic. 18 wheelers are not that you can just pull up in a in a small parking lot and just just stay there for two, three hours, right? So they are they are doing what they can the best, and we need them to be doing those pickups and deliveries, right? We've seen yeah. we've seen the other end of that. So so we're trying to find a solution to that community issue, just like you mentioned. Moving away from from research. Okay. Uh, I want to go into the the teaching area, okay. and I have a lot of questions around students, essentially. So, sure. future future workforce, <laughs> future workforce, big, uh, big issue, right? Big yeah. issue. Yeah, the reason I started this podcast and in general my presence is because I want to help people getting interested, young generation getting interested in Absolutely. supply chain management. So Absolutely. that is really a passion for me. Talking about the the students, what do you think? Looking around the room, maybe in your early cor courses you have, what are their motivations going into supply chain management? Currently, I think we have no issue in motivation. Supply mm -hmm. chain, number one, is a well-known topic right now. I cannot say the same thing about pre-pandemic. We used to say supply chain management and people will give us some looks like, what? but what do you really do, Right. But after the pandemic, when we actually didn't have any access to goods on the shelves, we saw a lot of empty shelves. We did not see some food items on the table. Suddenly everyone said, oh, okay, now I understand what supply chains are and what supply chain management possibly is really doing to, to make sure that we have goods on the table, on the shelves. Hmm. So... I think motivation-wise, uh, the motivation is there for our students. They have all seen and observed what supply chain really means and what it does for humanity, for all of us. And also they know that it is a well-paying field, right? Because it's a problem-solving field. If you can solve my problems as a company, I'm going to take care of you, right? Because you are saving me a lot of uh, otherwise costs that I would have incurred. And therefore, I'm going to be giving you a good salary. So I think the motivation is there. The good salaries are there. And our students are problem-solving minds. The new generation, you know, the old generation to a certain degree too, but they have grown in that problem-solving environment. So I think they like the challenge. Uh, they like the problem-solving attitude. Uh, and uh, that's what supply chain is, right? One day is not the same as the second day. And I think the students welcome that challenge. So so in that aspect, uh, we are seeing our uh, enrollment numbers grow very drastically, especially after the pandemic right now. Uh, so so that, these are really exciting times uh, in academia as far as uh, student enrollment is, is concerned for supply chain management. Personally, I love that you talked about the problem-solving attitude because, frankly, when, when I hired four operational roles in the past, that was for me always a, a key criteria, and I tried to identify this kind of mindset by looking at hobbies of, of people I interviewed actually sure. and, and ask them around their hobbies. And then I understood if they are problem solvers or not. If you look at your teaching and your courses, what are three of the main takeaways that you would give every student and that is important for them to realize when it comes to supply chain management? All of my students will say that he talks about cost and cost minimization a lot, right? So I think uh, cost minimization is a key topic for a company. Supply chain management can achieve a lot of these uh, cost minimization if they are done with the right techniques. But uh, the cost minimization, I always tell my students, should not be done at the cost of quality, right? 
So, so that's one of the key uh, main the main takeaways or key takeaways that I tell my students. Yes, we are after cost minimization. Who doesn't want to achieve that? But we really cannot afford to do that at the cost of quality because that's when we're going to start losing our customers. So that's one of the key takeaways that I always talk about in my classes, especially when I'm teaching operations management, uh, so that the students really understand that. Because sometimes the companies fixate too much on the cost minimization, and then we are giving away from quality as we are just fixating on that. And I don't think that's something that we can afford, especially in such a competitive environment. A second key takeaway that I would like to, to say is supply chain management, when done done right, uh, really keeps us in business. Uh, and when not done right, can basically draw us out of business. Uh, because again, the competitive advantage standpoint, I basically tell my students, you mean a lot for a company because you are really can, can make it or break it with the good work that you're going to be doing for a certain company. So that's another uh, key takeaway. I believe that supply chain management is a really key component of operations and a big arm of operations and actually uh, commands a lot of respect uh, in my eyes uh, because in, with the good work you're doing, you can make it for a company or you can really break it for a company. That's another uh, takeaway that, uh, that I give to my students. And the third one you asked for three of is really if you like your job you're not going there just to cut a paycheck then you're going to be happy you're going to have a, a good life you're going to be successful in your career and you're not going to feel like you're going to work right i know this sounds like a cliche but it's so true if you're passionate about what you do and if you really like what you do then you're just going to have fun right you're when somebody asks me sometimes uh, if i'm going to work i say i'm going to have fun because it's really fun when I get to work. I love working with students. I love working on my research. I love working on supply chain management uh, as an area in general. So, so to me, when I'm really going to work, I'm going to have fun. So I also emphasize that to my students because I've done some jobs, you know, professional level. Uh, it wasn't academic and that wasn't my passion back then. And it was uh, not exactly related to what we're talking about right now. And yes, it was it was giving me a good pay, but at the same time, it wasn't my passion. And that lasted uh, short for me because eventually I said, this is not worth it. And I moved on. And I'm really glad that, you know, I'm very passionate about what I do right now. Yeah, as a person that talks outside of work on a supply chain podcast <laughs> about supply chain, I can... 100% relate, okay? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, have, I have one more question, and I think I know the answer, but looking at, at dropout rates from students, I assume they're right now pretty low, but can you confirm that? And second, why do you think are people staying motivated once they are getting into supply chain management and the research? So the rates are not very high. So they are very low uh, at the moment. And I, it's been some time now it's like that because I believe supply chain management is such a niche area. Once you find yourself in it and as a student, you know this is what you want to do. You are very much compelled and you are driven to finish out your studies so you can go get that next promotion, if you will. Most of our students at the University of South Florida, we are in the the greater Tampa Bay area, basically it's, uh, you know, three and a half million uh, people. It's uh, like a metropolitan, the greater Tampa Bay area. So most of our students already have a job and they are basically getting their degree. Uh, so they are looking for that next promotion. So they are very committed. And our master's student, they, uh, about 95% of them, they have a job and they are basically looking to, to break into that next management uh, level category. So all of them are very driven. We don't see much dropouts. We do talk with our students. Uh, if we see some struggling students, we try to help them. We try to basically predict a possible future dropout, and we try to help them before it gets to that stage. Uh, so again, problem solving, we talked about that. So we try to predict, we try to model uh, the students' behavior or their grades so that we can actually interject before it gets to a point of no return. So, so at the moment, uh, our students are very committed. We're not seeing uh, any dropouts uh, the last three to five years. Uh, and that's a, a very good thing, again, for our workforce and workforce development. 
I love the problem solving. I can only reiterate that. A uh, quick sure. question on that still. Sure. So sometimes there can be a mismatch between a pragmatic problem solver and somebody being at university doing like long-term research. Do you, sure. is that an experience that you have as well? Or is that is that okay? Because the topic is so a hands-on topic, essentially. Good question. So we have a uh... We have really academic type of research also, and we have um, a lot of, again, in the lab, specifically the USF Supply Chain Innovation Lab, we have a lot of practical type of research also. So since our field is very broad, uh, I believe that it's able to, to sustain both types of approaches. And we are very lucky with the type of faculty we have at, uh, at the MoMA College of Business at, at USF, uh, that we, we have folks that can contribute a lot on uh, on academic type of research, theoretical type of research, which is still very much needed, right? Uh, most of the time I feel like folks uh, think, oh, you know, we know all these because we know all these. But when you look way back in the literature, somebody thought about that and planted the seed and that's where folks read on it. And then the, the industry took it to the next stage, right? So I feel like theoretical research is still very important to think about what is the next big thing, right? That we can actually replant the seed and then it grows again, a lot of industry involvement. Yeah. But practical research is also very important because it needs to be implemented. And how do you implement it? You have to have some hands-on research to be able to take it to the next stage. And the, the advantages portion about academic research is we can do it... Uh, using, again, graduate students, highly capable graduate students with, uh, of course, uh, uh, professor involvement and direction uh, for uh, for a much uh, a more affordable uh, uh, cost tag, price tag, uh, than compared to a consulting environment. So I think, uh, I think uh, academic research, both practical and theoretical, are needed. And I think uh, universities uh, do supply um, a, a good value proposition, if you will. Okay, so my, my last question for today is around your voluntary work with Feeding Tampa Bay. Sure. I, I, I see that you have done a lot of these voluntary work that all center around food. Why did you develop that as a passion? And how do you bring all of your supply chain experience into your voluntary work? Okay, oh, well, thank you for, uh, for asking me that. This is a uh, very close and dear to my heart, the voluntary work. I think um, with with some of our time, we need to to help our community, uh, and I've always felt that way. Uh, and I always try to carve up some time uh, through my my working week or my my working month, if you will, to be able to uh, to go and volunteer some of my time uh, to organizations such as Feeding Tampa Bay. Uh, I also worked at some of uh, uh, horse. Uh, uh, Farms uh, that basically uh, give rights to uh, uh, to kids with uh, with uh, different uh, abilities. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. like to use the word uh, disabled, but uh, with with different abilities, differently abled, uh, if you will. So um, again, close and dear to my heart. Uh, but uh, food scarcity is a big issue. Again, feeding Tampa Bay uh, looks to solve some of these issues within the Tampa Bay area. There are many organizations feeding. Uh, uh, you name it, just put a city there, right? Uh, and every city has its own issues through food scarcity. Uh, I normally go, sometimes it's just a manual labor. And sometimes uh, I offered my help. I said, I have a lot of uh, logistics and supply chain optimization background. Can I help you um, like a think tank, if you will, as a, as a part of a think tank um, with some of your operational issues? Can you know, I have a Lean Six Sigma green belt can we solve some problems for you, make your operations more effective? So I'm using uh, my time. Uh, some of it is manual. They need manual help still to create those boxes to get to the uh, the folks who are in need. So I'm happy to do that. But but some of them are in meetings with their management team to try to develop some more effective uh, methods so that uh, they can minimize just the simplest thing, their boxing time, for example, right? How much does preparing a box take uh, for them, how much does it take to load them on trucks? So we look at and how much volume can they, does the size of the box uh, differ? And of course the answer is yes. So we're looking at truck types, different boxes. So we're we're, we're able to, to look at those kind of things. Pretty cool, actually, from a 
outside perspective. I love that story. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. I think we're nearing the end. It was a very interesting story. I learned today a, a lot, a lot, because I never studied supply chain management in my life. I was okay. just thrown into the fire and had to sure. learn it there. There's <laughs> a lot of folks who are just like that, right? <laughs> yeah. No, but it, it's a good experience for me. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I think everybody who listened also found that to be very interesting. And for now, we want to say to everybody, bye-bye. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And thank you, everyone. Bye. This was Supply Chain Pioneers. Thanks for watching, listening, or however you are enjoying this podcast. You can find Supply Chain Pioneers on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all other major podcast players, as well as on YouTube at Ulf Talk Supply Chain. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. See you next time.